Hillary Graves. I'm the founder of Little Dish. Perfect. And tell us a bit about Little Dish. What is it and, and how did you start this business? So Little Dish is a range of freshly prepared meals for toddlers and young children. And um, it's kept in the fridge. So you buy it from the refrigerated section of the supermarket. And I started it in 2006 when I had my first baby. And I was really um, struck by the fact that if you did, you know, I made a lot of my own baby food, but if you weren't you know, making it yourself, the options to buy baby and toddler food in the supermarkets was, you know, were very grim. Um, you know, there was shelf stable options, um, jars and then pouches, but they sat on the shelf for up to two years. And then, you know, as your kids got a little older, there were some frozen options like chicken nuggets or fish fingers, but no one was really replicating what mothers were making in their own home, a proper, you know, freshly cooked, meal made from 100% natural ingredients and no salt and no sugar because you, you, you don't really add salt and sugar when your kids are that age. And so I, you know, and, and I also was looking at the use by dates and thinking, gosh, you know, this, this, um, this product is older than my baby and this just does not, you know, seem right. So uh, yeah, so, so the idea was, look, you know, I think that there's a gap in the market um, for something just like, you know, home cooked. Um, I certainly feel this way. I, I sort of checked with some, you know, friends and family and did some, you know, um, sort of anecdotal focus groups and sort of described this idea. What if you could buy in the supermarket, you know, you know, a, a freshly prepared meal for your young child that had 100% natural ingredients and no salt and no sugar. Um, you bought it from the fridge and people were really excited about it. Um, and so I really did think that there was a gap in the market. And I guess, you know, the other thing I would add is, so this was 2006, and I don't know if you remember, but um, Jamie Oliver had just done a really high profile campaign about school dinners, and it was becoming more and more, you know, clear that what kids eat at an early age, you know, has a long term impact on their not only physical health, but, you know, you know, mental health performance in school, and it was just so important to establish those healthy eat eating habits from a from an early age. And so I guess, you know, from the get go, we really had a strong social mission behind Little Dish, which was to make a positive difference in children's nutrition and, you know, hopefully, you know, help families, um, you know, in the UK and ultimately beyond feed their kids truly nutritious, fresh food. Yeah, I have a six month old currently going through weaning. So I'm very aware of, uh, of all these challenges. So it, it sounds like you had this realization and for the need of the product, just as there was all that, the publicity with Jamie Oliver and, and so on. So it sounds like really good timing. So was it fairly obvious, obvious to you fairly quickly that actually there was a, a real business here and, and you could really make something of this? Yeah, I mean, I felt like, you know, one of the reasons that we really focused on, focused on toddlers was about the business model, because that first, and you're going through it right now, so you'll be sort of in it and out of it in about two minutes, but you know, that six to 12 month old period goes quite quickly. It is high frequency, but it's a very short customer cycle. Um, and we felt that we were going to be making, you know, fresh food with short shelf life that we really needed to have, um, you know, a longer customer cycle, basically. And so the, the, the recipes that I developed were really from age one. Um, you know, I, I certainly gave it to my kids earlier, if you mash it, and I could, you know, would love to send you some for your baby. But, you know, from sort of nine months, I would just, it was sort of a texture issue. But certainly from a, as long as they've had all the ingredients, um, you know, it's appropriate um, um, for, for a little bit younger. But it was really sort of one to three year olds that we felt like, um, you know, no one was really doing anything for toddlers. And it's that kind of funny age where you're coming off of the purees, um, but you're not necessarily sitting down for family dinner every night because of the early bedtime, et cetera. So, um, and, and I guess now, interestingly, you know, sort of 14 years later, and I certainly fed it to my kids way past age two and three, but we're really seeing that our, um, you know, we have a following of sort of four and five-year-olds as well. Um, and so I think, um, and, you know, frankly, we eat them in the office because they're really delicious. It's just that some, when you're an adult, sometimes you want to maybe add a little bit of salt. Um, but I, you know, so, so to answer your specific question, yes, we felt like there was an exciting business opportunity. There was a gap in the market. The chilled meals category in the UK is very um, dominated by private label. So there weren't a lot of brands. And we felt like, you know, for this particular product, parents, 
by brands. You know, I, I think it's sort of 96% of baby food is branded. And um, coming out of that branded baby food, we felt that there was an opportunity for a brand to take that customer into, you know, toddlerhood with these fresh meals. And, you know, the buyers at the supermarkets were, were receptive to that. Um, and, and sort of, I think, felt like maybe it couldn't be done through private label and it would take a brand. Mm -hmm. So, yes. So, so that was sort of the early days. And we developed the recipes and, and sort of pitched to, um, various retailers and and in 2006 we we launched in 20 stores as a trial perfect and then fast forward to today i see that you're sold through many of the the major retailers here in the uk um what, talk to me a bit about the order of things so obviously you you put your product together and prove there's a, a need and a want for that product uh you raised a fair bit of investment so what is the order of approach in supermarkets approaching investors when ultimately you'll get a better deal if you've got one before the other? Yes, very good question. It's all very chicken and egg. Um, and I think the other thing that you need in there is a manufacturer. So it's sort of, you need to be able to make your product, but in order to make your product, you have to be able to promise volume. And um, you know, if, if, if you feel that you might need a little bit of funding, it's easier to get that funding if you've got you know, a, a, a developed product and a, and a listing with a supermarket. Um, for us, we basically, you know, we're lucky to find some friends and family um, to help. Um, so we sort of self-funded for a little bit um, and, you know, developed the recipes, um, you know, worked with an agency to, to help um, with the packaging design and the branding work, um, but did that on a very sort of cost-effective basis to say, look, you know, we know we'll have a better chance of getting funding if, you know, we've got a great looking, you know, brand and, 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 and great looking packaging. Um, but we don't have a lot to spend right now, but maybe this could be more of on sort of a success fee basis. Um, and so we did a little bit of the brand work and then, you know, we brought the recipes and the packaging into the retailers to, to, to tell them about it. And at the same time in the background was looking for somebody who could make it, but they're saying, you know, how many stores will you be in? And so you're sort of just juggling all of those conversations at once. Um, in the end, we uh, found uh, sort of a, this group of angel investors that wanted to um, put money in and they said, look, we're really interested. And as soon as you get that retailer listing, you know, then we can, we can start to support, um, you know, to, 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 to move forward in a more formal way with the funding. So mm -hmm. that was the order for us. Perfect. And, and obviously there's that challenge as well when you get that first supermarket on board. It's just being able, and you touched on this, being able to fulfill that first order in terms of yes. manufacturing capabilities, in terms of having the money behind you to, to have that sudden boost. Um, so how did you navigate just that that period? Well, I, you know, interestingly, we've, we've recently launched in the States. And I think one of the things that has been that was really helpful for us in the UK um, is that we weren't um, we had the flexibility with our manufacturing to make small batches. So a 20 store listing, um, you know, was something that we could make work, um, you know, with the obviously the long-term objective of, of growing that distribution and going into more supermarkets, but it allowed us to start quite small um, and really nurture those uh, 20 stores. And so, you know, this is, we didn't have, you know, big budgets for advertising. Um, and there was something really nice, I think, about testing a new product and to a certain extent, a new category that didn't exist before and really being able to kind of, um, handhold those those you know so we went into the stores we would go this is kind of pre um social media and you know we would go into the local communities and go to the local nurseries or to the you know children's play groups and we would drop off vouchers to the to the to the local supermarket and kind of spread this sort of viral kind of you know moms telling other moms um you know to to, to we'd hand out samples and um, and, you know, oh, and by the way, you can buy it here. And so, um, and that's kind of, I think, how we, we, we made that 24 trial, that 20 store trial a success. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we, were, we got an extended rollout and then we got another extended rollout and then we got our next retailer. So, whereas in the States, you know, one of the sort of challenges that we've had is that it's, you know, there's a minimum batch order, you know, and in order to make it, you have to be, 
um, you know, we, we, we needed much bigger distribution um, in the States from, from day one. So, um, you know, luckily we've been doing it for 14 years and we had, a, you know, some experience, but um, I think that that was very helpful for us here in the UK. And you mentioned sort of tactics before the world of social media. So really getting that face to face time and, and building up almost a, a community of mums, I suppose. Yes. Um, yes. How important is that today, even with social media? I think it's really important. If anything, I would say social media maybe, you know, lends itself to spreading the word, you know, in a more um you know, in, in a quicker way. Um, and, and so we were sort of doing the grassroots version of that by going into the local communities. And one of the things that was quite interesting was that we had mother, many mothers um, call us up and they would, you know, try the product. Some of them were on maternity leave and they would say, oh, we love this. And, you know, we're telling our friends and are you hiring? And, and, and we kind of formed this, um, informal really community marketing group of mothers in various areas who would invite other mothers over to their house. Um, we call them our community leaders and um, they would invite other mothers over and they would do a tasting and they would kind of spread the word and they were kind of our, you know, hands on the ground. I mean, this is 14 years ago before, um, you know, if you can imagine back when <laughs> there was no Instagram or if there was, I certainly didn't know about it. And so, um, you know, we were doing it really that way. Now, all of that has been, um, you know, sort of moved online. And, you know, we have a social media community. And I think people and mothers in particular are exchanging information and um, advice and suggestions for products for their kids through so social media and online. Yeah, I know. So obviously, my wife is part of a NCT. What yes, yes. Basically, it is all about recommendations. If one of them says they've bought something and it's really worked, all of them buy it immediately. So I can I can kind of see how important that is. Absolutely. I mean, there's no, I think, greater compliment than when a mother recommends Little Dish to another mother, because that's, you know, sort of... Um, I think the highest praise you can get if it's, you know, and, and, and I think you'll know this because you now have your first baby, but you kind of have this toolkit of the things that might make your, you know, life a little bit easier or, you know, um, make your baby's life, you know, sort of healthier or helps with sleep or whatever it is that you're sort of navigating through. Um, and that's something that we still try to really, I guess, embrace to this day of encouraging mothers to tell other mothers about Little Dish. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously, it's, it's a massive change then from the early days of the business to what it is today and with all the retailers and launching in the US and so on. So how has that changed your role within the business? Well, I guess in the early days, I was much more hands on. I was sort of, you know, founder and CEO and, you know, growing the business. Um, but I got to a certain kind of size where I felt like we really needed a different kind of skill set to come in if we were going to properly scale the business. Um, and actually, my husband joined as CEO in 2014, which was not planned at all. Um, but he, um, you know, had been a consultant and was in private equity and had started his own consulting group and had various clients and Little Dish was, you know, one of his clients and sort of helping us as we were navigating through and recruiting a, a CEO. And, you know, he start, he's obviously been, you know, involved with the brand from the beginning um, and he started to spend more and more time with it. And, you know, we, you know, we're doing, you know, better and better each month and each, each, each year. And so he, he sort of formally took the role in 2014. Um, and that was really great. I think, you know, one of the things that, you know, so, so now my role as a founder um, is much more, um, I would say brand ambassador and, you know, driving the relationships, the important relationships with the, with the brand and the business. So that's our key retail relationships, um, you know, being involved in product development, being in, involved in the, the marketing um, and communications. Um, and uh, he really runs the, the sort of operations and, and, and finance and day-to-day. -day. Mm. And, and tell me a bit about that then. So we hear uh, a lot about co-founders that are either siblings or, or married couples or uh, e even just good friends before starting the business. So what's your advice for handling the good days as, as well as the bad within the business? I think um, you mean sort of early. Well, <laughs> um, okay. So handling the good days and the bad. I mean, first of all, there are 
I think it, it's the very first thing is to recognize that there are definitely highs and lows and it's a big, big roller coaster. And, um, you know, it's just one of these things that you can't let the bad days, I think, um, put you off or make you discouraged because the fact is everybody has highs and lows. And I think every person who starts a business is going to say that was a really, you know, tough time for our business. That was a really, you know, great time for our business. And frankly, you know, we had a lot of, a little bit of good luck with that. And, um, you know, I think learning to sort of ride that, <laughs> you know, some sometimes ups and ups and downs and, and the roller coaster um, is, is sort of part of it and not letting that um, discourage you. Um, so I guess that that's that. I think also, you know, making sure that you've got a team um, that really complements your strengths. So I firmly believe that, you know, really one of the keys to success is having the self-awareness to really know your strengths and weaknesses, like what you're good at and what you're not good at and sort of leaning into your strengths and then, you know, hiring people who are really good at, at the things where you might have a gap. Um, and always hiring people, I think that are, you know, sort of smarter and better and, you know, just really, I think, I think having a, a good team can sometimes make or break um, whether or not, you know, you can have this amazing idea, you can have this gap in the market and, and, and those are both very important, but the team, you can't underestimate how important that is to get right. Um, and so I guess, you know, I would say, not letting the bad days really get you down and, you know, and just making sure you've got a good team in place and, and a support network, you know, so that you can navigate some of the challenging times. Mm. Yeah. I think a big part of it is also not bringing it home, um, which is easier said than done when you literally work at home at the moment. Um, right. <laughs> this is true. This is true. So just, yeah. to, I mean, just to, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Hillary. Well, no, I was just going to say, you know, one of the things that I've really liked about uh, starting Little Dish is that it really has been a family business. So even before my husband joined, um, you know, my children were really sort of the inspiration, you know, my first baby. And then I had another um, a couple of years later and they were, you know, not so much anymore because they're 14 and 11. But, you know, in the early days, they were such a critical part of the brand and, you know, the certainly the product development, they were sort of our quote unquote chief tasters. I mean, now we have a proper sort of tasting panel of 200 toddlers across the, um, across the country. We should, would love to have your baby join when he, yeah. do you have a boy or a girl? A little girl. A little girl. So when she's 12 months, maybe she can join our tasting panel, but you know, they were um, a really big part of the company and, you know, whenever we would do press, they would, you know, be there too. And they were part of the story. And so, you know, that really helped in some way, um, I think balance uh, work and, and home because, you know, Sometimes they would come to the office and they'd be there for, you know, when we were doing some recipe testing or if we had to do a photo shoot, they would come. They, you know, we did a very small advertising campaign and uh, they were in the advert, you know, so, so that I think has been um, a really lovely mix of, of work and home. Amazing. And just to finish off, where can people find out more about both yourself and Little Dish? Uh, at littledish.co.uk um, and we're available in all the UK supermarkets. So I, I think a lot of people might be buying groceries online right now. And so we're on tesco.com and sainsbury's.com and waitrose.com, asda.com, Mikado, morrisons.com, Amazon Fresh. So um, I know that sometimes, well, even in the best of times when it's not locked down, taking your young children to the supermarket can be, you know, <laughs> not necessarily your first choice of, of how to crack that, but, um, you know, we're in store and online. And, um, you know, I think what I've found, I mean, as I just said, I have an 11 year old and a 14 year old, but they're both obviously uh, doing remote learning right now. And I'm feeding them little dish for lunch because, you know, suddenly you have a whole nother, you know, they're usually at school for lunch and now you have a whole nother kind of meal occasion where two working parents kind of juggling. And I, I think, um, you know, during lockdown in particular, it can be a great resource sort of no matter how old your children are.